stand and sing and rejoice in the love of our God. When darkness tries to roll over my bone, when sorrow comes to steal and joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. Jesus, he 
Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Amen. Hey, good morning. Before you have a seat, would you please turn around to the beautiful people around you and say good morning? Good morning. My name is Laura, and I am the kids director here. And uh, the a few weeks ago, I got to take my grandkids to one of the most wondrous places on the planet. I got to take them to the aquarium, and there is something about being 
at an aquarium where you're standing in front of that big glass wall with all of the brilliantly colored creatures swimming in front of you. And I don't know, it's, and, and watching the kids' faces as they realize that they are only familiar with less than half of what's in the world, it's absolutely magical. This year for Kids Camp 2024, we get to create that world for kids where they get to experience the wonder of God's creation. We are presenting Operation Scuba. It's going to be amazing. Yes. Um, if you have not signed your kids up yet, I will tell you this. We are more than half full. I anticipate it filling up today after I make these announcements. And so what you can do if you're panicking right now is at the info counter, there are these cards that have a QR code on the back and you can register your kids. It's for ages 5 to 10. And if you're sitting here thinking, well, I have littles, I have kids that are younger than that, that's okay. We still have room for people to volunteer and our volunteers can bring their uh, zero to four-year-olds to come and have a blast as well. You can volunteer by going to our website under the events portion and find Kids Camp and there is a way to volunteer. There's another link there for you to volunteer. If you are new here with us this morning, I want to say welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Um, you should have received a bulletin on your way in. We would love to get to know you. And so if you would, put your name and your email address. We would love to connect with you. And you can drop those in the giving boxes in the back. And I, we're going to stand right now as we turn our attention to the scriptures. All right, scripture reading is out of Genesis 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards the heaven. Number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord. You may take a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Seth. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here. And I get to introduce our guest speaker here today. We have Adam Bailey joining us. Can you give him a round of applause? He's going to come on up and preach. Adam, come on up. We, uh, we had to get a special uh, stand because sometimes people get Adam and I uh, mistaken. You know, we're kind of on the height side. La last week, Matthew did announcements, and there's that table that I teach from. And someone said, did they lower the table? I'm like, no. Uh, Five nine six five. So he's got got this going on. But Adam is the lead pastor of Christ Church Gilbert and the senior lead pastor over the Christ the Christ Churches. And we're uh, really glad we get to have you here here with us today. So let me pray for Adam, and I'm I'm excited for us to get to chew on Genesis 15, and we're excited for him to lead us through that. So uh, Lord, thanks for bringing Adam here. I pray that you would open our hearts uh, and open our ears and help us hear from him what you have to say for us this morning. Amen. Well, thanks Amen. for being here, Adam. Amen. Thank you. Good to be with you all. I am uh, honored to be uh, here. I'm honored to open up God's Word with you. Uh, thankful for uh, Seth's invitation to come and to be a part of this season where Luke is resting, well-earned rest. Luke has been a dear friend of mine since I arrived in the Valley uh, 12 years ago. He has been consistent in my life and a faithful encourager. Um, and uh, it's been a joy to walk with him through this last uh, just over a decade. So uh, I am thankful for what God is doing at Ironwood, and uh, when my family is not at Christ Church, occasionally we have snuck in, tried to sneak in, and uh, worship with you. We've done that several times, and uh, I'm just privileged to be with you today. So I hope you have your Bible still open there to Genesis chapter number 15. I want to dive into this uh, with you, and I find it 
a little overwhelming to step into the middle of a series in a book uh, and to try to do my part, but I'm going to do my best. And the reality of the matter is, is that in God's kind providence, I got chapter 15 because I didn't want chapter 13 or 14, and I didn't want chapter 16 or 17. So I'm thankful that I got to be here with you in chapter 15, and I'm gonna, in just a moment, I'm going to read the rest of that chapter with you. So if you've got it open there, get prepared, and if you're able to take some notes, maybe that would be something that you could uh, do to help you remember what we've studied today and be sure that it's actually what God's Word says for us. The reality of the matter is, is as we come to Genesis chapter 15, we are interacting with ancient history. And I don't know that you've considered it, but there's almost nothing in ancient history that will have any bearing upon this next week for you. There's almost no historical story from the ancient days. Think like 3200 BC and the Egyptian hieroglyphic script is created. How much is that going to come to bear on next week for you? If it is, I'd like to meet you. You're a fascinating person. <laughs> the, the old thing, I'm talking like ancient, ancient history, just do not have much to do with us. The great battles of the Persian Empire, unless you are teaching history, they have no bearing on what's about to happen in the week and how you and I will relate to the week. But when we come to Genesis 15, the situation is entirely different. We are interacting with ancient history. We're talking like Abraham is like maybe 1950s to the early 2000s on the other side, B.C. We're talking about somebody who is ancient. And this is written in the middle of a little bit more recent but still ancient history because it's written by Moses in the midst of the wilderness wandering in Sinai. It is written as a record so that Moses could give not just the nation of Israel, but even the people who are gathering at Ironwood in 2024, as the heat starts to creep into our lives, the opportunity to be benefited in our faith, to be shaped in the way we walk out our faith and live on the mission of Jesus Christ. That's how linked we are to this ancient narrative. So, Do not come to this this morning, church family, with some kind of idea that this is irrelevant because it is so old or irrelevant because it is so far away. Because of Jesus Christ, the great answer to God's words to Abraham, the great culmination of God's covenant, which we'll discover today with Abraham, through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we have come to be the sons and daughters of Abraham through faith. Which draws my mind back to a song from 1971. If you grew up a church kid at all, I think you probably know. And if you were put on the spot and your life depended on it, you could even do the motions for Father Abraham. (laughs) Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And I'm not sure why we spun around or why our right arm went up and then our left leg went out. I don't know. I'm just saying we know that song because of how important this reality is that we're running into in Genesis chapter number 15. So if you would, I just want to pick up with you and read verse 7 down through verse 21. I teased Seth that he avoided reading all the ites at the end. So I'll try. Pick up in verse 7 with me and read your Bible if you have it there in front of you. And God said to him, I am Yahweh, I am the covenant name of God, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them, or Abram rather, drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, 
and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out from, for, with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites. I'm three for three. Hang in there. The Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. These are the words of God for us this morning. May the Spirit of God help us now to get them and to be gotten by them. Here's another text that I want you to have if you're taking down a note or putting it in your note app. Be sure that you have before you. I'm going to read it multiple times in your hearing. Galatians chapter number 3 in your New Testament. Galatians 3, 7 through 9. So before we dive into the text, listen, verse 7 of Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, and the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel before to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Here's a simple sentence that I want you to have, and I'm going to take it straight out of 1971. Father Abraham had many sons, so let's just praise the Lord. And I want to apologize as a guest speaker for putting Father Abraham back into many of your brains. <laughs> if it's not there, please do not Google it later. You don't need that in your life, but you do need this sentence. Father Abraham has many sons and daughters, not by bloodline, but by faith line. And the praise that ought to come from us in the week to come has everything to do with what we've been connected to through faith in the finished work of the culmination of the promise in our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to show you exactly what causes us to praise God as sons and daughters of Abraham. What do we get? What are we connected to? What are we grafted into? What do we get to partake of from chapter 15? Because we're linked to Abraham if, in fact, you follow Jesus in faith. And if you're not following Jesus by faith, I'm so thankful you're here. I want you to have these same blessings. And Jesus is the only means by which we could ever have them through faith in the finished work of Christ. So there are three of them, three reasons for us to praise God as descendants through faith of Abraham, and I'm just going to lay them out for you, and I'll show them to you in the text, and then I'll just trust the Spirit of God we will use them in the week to come, because this ancient history should affect us this week. So here they are. Every Christian possesses these three causes for praise. Number one, every Christian possesses God's promises as privilege. Privilege is not inherently negative, though it has been used that way culturally at times in our recent history. Privilege is merely an opportunity. It is a stewardship. It certainly can be abused, but it is also the great opportunity to live in a way that you could not otherwise live. And the promises of God that become ours through faith in Christ, believing God, along with our forefather in faith, Abraham, is one of the richest privileges of our lives as the people of God. So I just want to take a moment to show you what God said and to remind you of what God said to Abraham. Abram is not at this point, he's not been renamed as Abraham, I'm going to call him that likely all morning, stuck in my brain. Abram at this point is not somebody that we would think of as a superstar or a model or one to emulate. And yet God continues to graciously interact with him and when we get to verse number 1 of chapter 15, we get kind of a prophetic setup. The word of the Lord came to Abram, and that, that's a prophet kind of language from your Bible. This is very unique. God is going to interact in a very special way. And the first thing he says in verse 2 is he calls Abram, or verse 1 rather, is fear not. Then he says, I'm your shield. Then he says, your reward will be great. So what he has already said in chapter 12 and onward 
he now reiterates, but he addresses the promises to fear. There's fear connected in Abram's heart. There's fear in the face of the in-between. There's fear in the sense that nothing has happened yet. There's no evidence yet. Yahweh has called this pagan vagabond to be his, his forefather for his people. And yet there's nothing that is proving that the blessing is coming. So fear is welling up, as fear likely will well up in our hearts at some point in this week, and we will be in the position to doubt God's validity, it is the promises that we get to have that are our privilege. He is the shield that is a protector for us. Our souls are protected through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the reward is great in the end. He does not say, you're missing all the evidence. He says, I'm here. I know. Don't be afraid. I'm the shield. And the reward will be great. The people of God have always lived with their eyes looking out while our lives are being lived here in the realities of this world. I like to say that we're not in the sweet by and by, right? We're in the nasty now and now. And the nasty now and now requires us to believe promises. And we get those promises. Like we're in this. This is our family promise because of faith in Jesus Christ. From every background and story, every nationality, ethnicity, cultural story, we get to come into these if in fact we placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ for us, the Son of God who is our Messiah and our Savior. So the promises come that he's a shield, a protector, he's a giver of reward that will be very great. And Abram responds just the way we would think to respond. He says to him, what will you give me? I would like details. That's what he wants. I want details. Because at this point, we're down to Eleazar of Damascus. All right? And this is culturally the way of the world. He's thinking, I don't know how this is going to happen. I'm an old dude already. How's this going to pan out? What are you going to do? Verse 3, you give me no offspring. A member of my household, that's somebody who I adopt to be the, the heir, will have to be the heir in verse 3. And now God speaks to him in verse 4. This man shall not be your heir. And then he says this. Do you see this at the end of verse 4? Your very own son shall be your heir. And in the translation we're using, when it says your very own son, that's trying to smooth out maybe and make it a little less uncomfortable for us to read what he's saying there. He's saying the son that comes from your body parts will be the heir. Are you tracking with me? I don't want to go any further in detail on what the Hebrew is saying here. What he's saying to him is, I know what I'm doing. I see where you are. I will bless. I am protecting. I will accomplish. Don't be afraid. And it will be from your loins. I know exactly what I'm doing. And Isaac will be ultimately, hate to be the spoiler of what's coming in Genesis, but Isaac will be that answer to the promise. He takes him out in verse 5 and says, look at the stars. He's already said, look at the sand. Now he says, look at the stars. Number them. That's what your family's going to be like. Listen, now, you can read that as ancient history and be like, yeah, I got nothing with that. That's huge for this coming week. We sit in the line of the promises of God to Abraham through faith in the finished work of the Son of God for our salvation. Therefore, we have no need to fear. God is our protector. Our reward will be great. And he has been faithful to deliver on the promise to Abraham. The people of God now outnumber the stars. And there will be myriad upon myriad in the eternal glory who are worshiping because of the work of God on our behalf through the forefather who believed, whose name is Abraham. Does that make sense? So don't, don't disconnect. Don't, don't think of this as some kind of like archaic, ah, I don't know what's going on there. There's a lot of weird things happening here culturally. This guy seems a little disturbing. That's true. And God is faithful. God is faithful. The distance you have from the promises of God in this week to come have a lot to do with how you'll live for God in the week to come. How disconnected you might sense your soul to be from the promises of God has a lot to do with how you relate to the circumstances that are coming in your life or that are already here. 
My wife and I have been married for 22 years. We've got three kids, 16, 14, and 12. And basically, we drive to practice right now. That's what we do with our whole life. <laughs> we drive and drop off. We picked up a new driver, so that's nice. Now we got another driver to go to practice. So we're, we're just living our lives that way. Here's the thing about kids, at least my kids. I don't know about the other kids represented in the families in this room, but my kids have a hard time remembering some very important parts of their life. I mean, I'm talking like shoes kind of stuff and like homework for sure. And there's a lot of forgetfulness going on. But they have an amazing ability to never forget, never forget the smallest reckless promise that I have made <laughs> that would be to their benefit. Dad, three weeks ago you said we would go to ice cream at some point in the season and I have not forgotten. I have lived by faith in your promise <laughs> to this point. I mean, they are powerfully connected to promises. You said that if I outgrew these shoes, you would buy better shoes for me. My toes are sticking out. My kids are, I, Seth's kids maybe, we're going to have a little different story. But my kids, my 14-year-old daughter is six foot one. She's wearing size 11 shoes. She hurt her knee recently. They did an MRI. The doctor said, good news, bad news, good news. The knee's not hurt that bad. Bad news, those growth plates are wide open. <laughs> they don't forget the promises. They don't forget what their father has said to them. And here we run into Father Abraham receiving promises from our Heavenly Father, and we have the privilege of having those in our life as well. Now here's the enemy's tactic. Here's the enemy's tactic. Are you ready? This is what's going to come this week. He's going to offer you the same benefits of the promises with different ways to get them. He's going to offer you comfort when you're afraid through different means than through trusting in the promises of God. He's going to offer you protection when you feel vulnerable in different ways than through walking in the truth of what God says about you and what he has said to you. He's going to offer you that there is a great reward. It's just going to come a different way if you'll just get that promotion, if you'll just get that money to increase, if you could just get the possessions to go up, if you could just get the retirement to grow, if we could just get these markets to turn, if something would change. It's an alternative to the promise that God has made. So grab on in Genesis 15. Because as Christians, as sons and daughters of Abraham, we have reason to praise God. The promises are ours. Okay, that's the first. Here's the second privilege or benefit that comes to us, blessing that comes to us because we're connected to Abraham through faith. Number two, really the center of the entire book is in verse six. Every Christian possesses God's redemption. Wink, wink. I threw that in there on purpose for you. God's redemption as reality. Sorry, was that not funny? I will not do that in any of the other services. Uh, that will not be something that I think is funny in any other moment of my life. So anyway, God's redemption as reality. This is our reality. Verse 6 is our story. This is not just like Mesopotamian stuff. It's, this is like today stuff. This is everything for the nation of Israel in the wilderness. This is what they desperately needed. They needed to see the example, to hear the reality that's presented in verse 6. Abram believed God. He trusted God on the merit of God's character. He believed what he could not see, and God counted it to him as righteousness. He credited it to him. He redeemed Abram. This doesn't have to be the first time that Abram believes. It's just the formal time. Just like it's not the first time God promises, but it's the formal promise. Abram believed God, and it was counted into his account as righteousness that he didn't do. <laughs> this is the most fundamental distinctive of our reality as God's people, as Christians. We don't have righteousness because of what we do. We have righteousness credited into our account because of who we believe. Abram believing God would be faithful to his word, unaware of what would come 
so many years later in the person and the work of Jesus of Nazareth. We, looking back at Jesus of Nazareth, at the culmination of God's promises, believe that he's the Messiah. He is the Son of God who took human flesh. He was tempted in every way like us but did not sin. He died in substitution payment for our sin penalty. He rose on the third day from the dead never to die again, conquering sin and the grave. And therefore, through faith in him, we are credited with righteousness that he performed. Abram was, here's a theological word, justified. He was counted righteous. He was declared legally to be righteous on the same grounds as us. He believed God, and God took the righteous perfection of Jesus and credited it into his account. That's the same story. We're just on the other side of it here. The ancient history side is looking forward to Jesus. Here we are in 2024 looking back to Jesus, and redemption is our reality. Now that changes everything for this week. That means that whatever happens this week, if in fact you placed your faith in Christ, along with Abraham, with the blessings of Abraham, because Father Abraham has many sons, many sons as Father Abraham, so let's just praise the Lord We're the people who go through that situation as redeemed. We get that call as redeemed. We face that cultural news story as redeemed. Our Twitter feed runs and we read it as, actually just stop reading it. (laughs) We read it. As redeemed, the television is on, maybe just turn it off, but the television is on and we watch it as redeemed. Do you see that? That's a reality. This is the greatest reality of our lives. And the great battle we're in is for the truth of what is our greatest reality. So the reality that's going to come in this week is going to be what you can feel and what you can touch and what you can see and what you feel. It's going to be coming So Genesis 15 is here in our Bible, just reminding us that God has made promises and through faith in his word to us that Jesus is the Savior for us, we have been counted as righteous. We're going to stand before God in the judgment day and he's going to say, righteous, and you will not look and go, you better believe it. I worked hard at this. There will be no boasting. Merely there will be the song of praise. Because through faith, we have been given what we could never earn. Through faith, we've been credited with righteousness that is not our own. It's foreign to us, but has been put on our account with Abram. Abram is justified. We are justified. God's redemption is our reality. We share that together with Father Abraham. Does that make sense? Amen? Okay. So why I'm living spiritually is because of the work of God on my behalf. Why I'm living now is for the glory of God, for me to live as Christ. Where I'm going then and to die is gain because I am redeemed. Redemption is my story. That's the second reason to praise God. Here's the third reason. It's in that back half that I read with you, maybe the most confusing of what we've seen. Every Christian possesses God's covenant as confidence. And I don't know if reading that about the animals being cut in half made you more confident or less, or just made you a little bit heart sick. You're kind of like, oh man, and at least the pigeons didn't get cut up. I don't know what you were thinking there. I don't know if you were thinking like, this is getting weirder as we read. I, I affirm that. Culturally, this is very far away. This is ancient history. This is an old way to do a covenant where the animals would be split and laid out, and then there would be a walking between them by the two parties that were agreeing in the covenant. It was like a, it was like a visual aid with these animals to two parties walk through, and they basically say, if we break the covenant, this is what will happen to us. It's a powerful picture, except that's not what happens. Because it gets prepared like they're going to walk through it together. Abram and God are going to walk through it together, but that's not what happens. God causes Abram to fall into a deep sleep, like the deepest kind of sleep. The kind of sleep where you wake up and you don't know what year it is. You had those? You're watching golf, and then you wake up and you're like, I don't know, am I late on a high school assignment that I've got to get done? This is like gnarly sleep. 
And in the middle of it, God speaks to him. But far more than that, I want you to know what we saw and what you were reading with me. If you were reading with me, when we read verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And I know that you got to have a lot of your Bible to understand what's going on here, but maybe you already have some. Do you remember how God will reveal himself in the Exodus? How, will, how had he already, for these people who were reading it for the first time in the wilderness of Sinai, they had already experienced something that was the evidence of the presence of God. It was cloud and fire. Cloud and fire. What's happening here is only one person, only one of the parties in the covenant is walking through the middle. God is making this covenant God will keep this covenant. This covenant does not depend on Abram doing the right thing. This is God doing the gracious thing because he wants to. For the sake of his glory and for us to be his people from every tribe and tongue and nation. To be a people that are so many that the stars aren't even equivalent. This is the covenant of God. It's set up in this weird ancient way. There's this very strange sleep with statements about the exodus, about the fact that Egypt for 400 years would be the people of Abram, the bloodline of Abram would go through that, but they would come back. This is all happening. The people in Sinai are reading it. It matters to them. This history is important to them, but it's important to us as well. Because what we're finding here is that there is a God who makes covenant and keeps it. And that should bring confidence some things are settled. I don't know how you feel, but I know in this week to come, there's going to be a sensation of things are not settled. Things feel out of control. Things don't feel right. The ground feels like it's shifting underneath of my feet. I can't keep my balance as a person. Come back to Genesis 15 and remember that there are some things that are absolutely settled. They are absolutely sure. The ground will never move because the person and work of Jesus Christ has accomplished and fulfilled and satisfied this covenant promise made to Abraham and made to us. So in the midst of an uncertain life, we live with certainty. The contract may fail this week, but the covenant of God will not. World War III might break out this week. I feel like I could have said that and always just kind of be like, yeah, maybe, but actually could break out this week. And the covenant of God will hold. He will not fail. He is not out of control. He is the sovereign king of heaven and earth. The maps might get rewritten, redrawn, and the covenant will not fail. See, this changes our week. Where's my confidence found? It's in the covenant maker and covenant keeper. It is with God himself, who has left heaven's glory, entered our humanity, and provided the fulfillment of the promises. We may suffer, we may be persecuted as followers of Jesus, but the covenant made to Abram will not fail. We're the people of God. So, Father Abraham had many sons, so let's just praise the Lord. God's promises are ours. God's redemption is ours. God's covenant, it's ours. Through faith, we have received these blessings. Not through bloodline, but through faith line with Father Abraham. This is what Jesus taught in John chapter 8. He told people, this is the way you actually know whether you're a son or daughter of Abraham. It's not ultimately bloodline. It is faith in him that establishes that faith line for all eternity. So what do we do with this? Let me give you some take-homes. At Christ Church, we call this learning in order to live. We don't learn to learn. We don't just want to know stuff about Genesis 15. I want you to be able to take something home. First one is faith matters more than family. It's just that. It's that it's not about who you're related to. It's about who you're trusting. Have you placed your faith in the good news promise that God will save souls? He will cover sin. He'll forgive our failures of his holy requirement. He will give us righteousness, not we earn it. He'll just give it. He'll credit it into our account through faith in Jesus. And there's eternal life because the tomb is empty. There's an empty grave in the Middle East. So we now have access 
to eternal life through God's grace to us. It's faith over family in the sense that it is not about who you know in bloodline. It is who you trust for your soul. Okay? Students in the room, young people in the room particularly, it may be that you have been kind of been attaching yourself to the faith of your folks or grandma and grandpa. Be reminded, this is the privilege for all those who personally believe God and are counted as righteous. Number two, truth must demystify the times. This is like big worldview stuff from ancient history. What's going on today? I don't know everything that's going on. There's no way I can know everything that's going on, but I know a few things that are going on, and they're the biggest things that are going on, and we have a mission that flows out of that. So demystify. It's not all about can we all know all the information? We can't. Can we trust all the sources? We can't. But we do know the biggest things that are happening through faith. We have become the recipients of this word to us. And number three, mission mandates the message. Here's my question for you, Ironwood family. What are you known for discussing with the most passion? It'll betray what your mission is in this life. What are you known for discussing with the most zeal? You might be the quietest person, the most reserved, but there's something that gets you fired up. May it be the good news of a covenant with God through faith in Jesus Christ so that the mission advances because we live here telling others of what we have found to be true in the faithfulness of the word of God. Genesis is ancient history that has everything to do with the coming week. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7 through 9. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preach the gospel before unto Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Father Abraham had many sons, so let's praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this portion of it, such a critical part of our Bible, so necessary for our understanding of the world and life and eternity. So I pray now that you would use it in your people to strengthen and encourage And I pray that you would use it for our friends that are with us this morning who do not know you the way we do, that you would draw them in to the necessity for someone to bring covering, someone to provide righteousness, someone to give eternal life. May they be drawn to Christ as you've done for us. We trust you for these things. We believe that your word is living and active. We believe the gospel together. May even the closing moments of our worship remind us of what is most true, the reality of our redemption. And may you receive praise and honor, Lord Jesus. You are worthy of it all. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to now take the rest of our service to respond to that word. We're going to do so in a couple different ways. We're going to sing in a moment. Just praise the Lord. We're made righteous uh, by faith in what he's done. Uh, Number two is you can give. You can give by texting that number on the screen or by dropping the giving stations in the back. But first we're going to take the Lord's Supper together and reflect on that sermon. Uh, This Lord's table is is a place for people who believe in what these elements represent. So if you're not a Christian, please don't pretend to trust in what these represent and please don't pretend to be one. Uh, Children, please follow the instructions of your parents or guardians. Uh, But this moment for us, just like God passes through the animals cut in half by himself, saying this covenant is on me. So also Jesus hangs on the cross by himself and says salvation is on me uh, and by myself. And so we're going to take a moment. You can quiet our hearts, confess our sin to the Lord, and in just about a minute, I'm going to lead us through taking these elements together. But let's specifically confess, specifically repent, and do business with the Lord by the Spirit for about a minute here.
good news of Jesus, the virgin birth, the sinless life, the substitutionary death, and the glorious resurrection are pictured to us in these elements. And on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Let's thank the Lord and take it together. took the cup, to this cup, the cup of the new covenant, his blood shed for forgiveness of our sins, that we are made righteousness by faith in what this represents. Let's take it together. Jesus, thank you for doing what we could not ever have a shot at doing for ourselves. Amen. Now will you stand and we're going to do what Adam called us to, which is praise the Lord.
Nice and loud. Say yeah. 
Amen. Amen. That is great news. If you would like to learn how to build your house on Christ and on nothing else, to believe God and be counted righteousness, we'll have a prayer team in the back left of the room who would love to help you become a Christian today. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today, Adam. Can you give him a round of applause? It's so great to have him here. Uh, before we go with benediction, I'd like to pray over us um, as we head on out. Thank the Lord that our salvation doesn't depend on us. May we walk in confidence, knowing our foundation is firm and unchanging. Amen. Love you all. Have a great rest of your Sunday.